dismissed for that uh, at this time. I'm going to ask you to turn in your Bibles this morning to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13, and I'm going to read uh, verse uh, 31 to uh, 35 for you this morning. Matthew 13, 31 to, uh, to 35. And while you are turning to that, uh, I want to say, uh, great job, Bill Haas. Anybody get to the, the arsenic and old lace? Man, that was great. Bill, that was a super. So... We had a great time last night with Tim and Jody. Dave and Don Vandenberg were there. Uh, uh, a dinner in the theater. Boy, that was, that was wonderful. That was wonderful. I feel like saying bully right now. Just, you know, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> Theodore Roosevelt, man. I, tell you, I just feel like saying that. Matthew 13, 31 to, uh, to 35. Let me just kind of review a little bit where we've been at. And over the last five, six weeks, we've actually only looked at two parables. We took the parable of the sower in four weeks, and last week we looked at the parable of the wheat and the tares. The parable of the sower, wonderful parable, telling us about how the kingdom advances. The kingdom advances when people respond to the word of God, and they're growing in faith, and they're bearing fruit for the kingdom of God. That's how the kingdom advances. But we also learn that sometimes the kingdom doesn't advance, because when we share the word of God, there are some people who hear the word of God, and they're walking out of here, and they're already leaving that behind, saying, I'm not interested. Falls on hard heart. There are some people who look like they embrace the gospel with enthusiasm and joy, but when trials and difficulties come, they wander off and they're never to be seen again. Shallow ground. And there are people who look like they embrace the word of God, but the cares of the world and the pursuit of riches and material wealth derails and attracts them away. And so they too do not come to Christ as Savior and Lord. But we know how it advances, and that's when people respond to him, and they're growing, and they're bearing fruit for Jesus Christ. Last week, we looked at the parable of the wheat and the tares. Kind of a warning, isn't it, from where Jesus tell, what Jesus gives us. A warning, knowing, first of all, that people who embrace Jesus Christ and the reign and the rule of Christ rules in their hearts. They're going to be mixed in with people who do not embrace the kingdom of God, where Jesus is not ruling over their hearts. And we know that one day, it's not for us, but it's for Jesus when he sends his angels to separate those two, the wheat and the tares. And so, it gives us all the more impetus to try to bring Christ to the nations, um, so that they are counted amongst the wheat, and not the weeds in our lives. Today... I'm going to read two parables to you. What's a parable? Well, the old Sunday school lesson says it's an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Let me tell you, also, in my version, it's a short, small story with a big point. All right? It's got a huge point to it. And we're going to read two parables today. By the way, these two parables, they're like cousins. They're not like twins. Okay? I'm a twin. All right? My mom loved it when we were young, and she could dress us up the same way, with the same clothes and the same everything. It was so cute to look at the Anderson twins, okay? But I've got cousins, too. The twins look alike. The cousins resemble each other, but they're not exactly alike, okay? These two parables resemble each other, right? But they're not exactly alike, all right? So I want to tell you that today, and before we read that, Let's pray. Let's pray. Lord God, my prayer is that you would incline our hearts to hear your word. Father, I'm very aware of the fact that when we sit in a congregation like this, our hearts may be inclined to thinking about What's for lunch today? Our hearts may be inclined to be thinking about who's playing football today. Our hearts may be inclined to thinking about everything that took place this week and it was a difficult week. Or our hearts may be inclined to be thinking about challenges that I'm facing in my family or in my job or, or wherever. And Lord, just for a few minutes today, Lord, I pray that we'll push, put that away. 
And Lord, we'll incline our heart towards your word. That somehow, Father, we'll, we'll embrace that word in such a way that it really speaks to us, Father. And so, God, that's my prayer this morning. May your word, uh, may your word hit, uh, hit us and move us, Father, to follow your priorities. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Matthew 13. By the way, you do have a sermon outline in your bulletin. We'll have it up here as, uh, as well. Matthew 13, beginning in verse 31, says, He presented another parable to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, and this is smaller than all other seeds. But when it is full grown, it is larger than the garden plants, and it becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. He spoke another parable to them, second parable. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three pecks of meal until it was all leavened. All these things Jesus spoke to the multitudes in parables. And he did not speak to them without a parable, so that what was spoken through the prophet might be fulfilled, saying, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things hidden since the foundation of the world. And may God add a blessing to, uh, to his word here this morning. I want to point three things out to you today that, uh, that these two parables reveal. And uh, the first point is going to be a little bit more of a review for you from last week before we really start to get into the application process. Although, we have to find this as well. But I want you to bear with me because I want to try to explain again some of the things I talked about the last week. The first thing I want to show you is that these are two parables about the kingdom, the kingdom of God. And one of the things you're going to notice in Matthew 13 is there are seven parables. There are seven parables. And in every parable, Jesus starts out by saying the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God is like, or the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God may be compared to, and he gives you that comparison. And so I want to explain again what Jesus is talking about when he's talking about the kingdom of heaven. And he does it in three, three ways. He says that the kingdom of heaven is about, first of all, if you could put that up there, Gerald, for me, that'd be great. Jesus is the king of that kingdom. Jesus is the king. He got off his throne in heaven. He humbled himself and he took upon himself human flesh. He entered into human history. He didn't enter on a throne, did he? He entered in a manger. Not in glory, but in humility. Not in wealth, but in poverty. Not to be worshipped, but to be crucified. And when he came, people scan were scandalized because he didn't look like a king. They had no concept of a humble, loving, generous, servant king who would ride into Jerusalem one day on a donkey. Because it should have been a white horse. But nevertheless, he's a king. A kingdom has to have a king. And he is the king of that kingdom. Right? Number one. Number two, the kingdom is about wherever Jesus rules. We talked about this last Sunday. But the kingdom of God is about where Jesus rules and reigns over our hearts and over our lives. In Mark 10, verse 15, it says, Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child will not enter it at all. Which means that just as a child submits to the rulership of their parents, so we are to open our hearts to the rulership of the King, Jesus, and He is to rule in our hearts. And we are to proclaim that message. I want to show you Acts chapter 19 again. Paul says, it says here, and he does, Paul entered the synagogue and continued speaking out boldly for three months, reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. He was in the synagogue trying to reason with them, trying to persuade them about the kingdom of God. That's part of what I do as well. I am trying to reason with you. I'm trying to persuade you about following Jesus' priorities in the kingdom of God and letting him rule over your heart and over your life. That's the second thing. 
The third thing is, is that the kingdom is about a future reality where Jesus will rule forever. That is, it's not just, it's here sort of as a foretaste of heaven as he rules in our hearts now, but one day Jesus is coming again. Amen? Amen. Jesus is coming again. Jesus lived without sin. Jesus died for our sin. Jesus rose as our Savior. He ascended back into heaven and he's preparing a kingdom that will never end. That will never end. I love what Revelation 1 4 says right at the beginning. John, who writes this to the seven churches that are in Asia Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea. To those churches in Asia, grace to you and peace from him. Who's he talking about? He's talking about Jesus, who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are what? Before his what? His throne. And if you read Revelation, you'll find that word throne often. You'll find the fact that Jesus is sitting on a throne. He is a king who rules a kingdom, who sits on a throne, and one day he's coming back, and he will rule forever and ever. And one day you know this, right? Every knee is going to bow, and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Amen? He's going to do that. So that's the kingdom of God. Every time Jesus says, um, you know, the kingdom of heaven is light, that's what he's talking about. He's the king. He wants to rule our hearts now, but one day he's coming again, and he is going to rule forever. And so, what does he compare the kingdom to? This is the second thing I want to show you. What does he compare it to? Well, here's the two parables. Kingdom starts small and grows big. It's a big idea, and I want to talk to you about that. Look at it. He presented another parable to them saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. What's a mustard seed? Anyone know what a mustard seed is? I mean, man, yeah, it is small. Small, small, small. Now, most commentators think that Jesus is talking about the black mustard seed. There are different varieties of mustard seed, by the way. They think he's talking about the black mustard seed. I uh, remember somewhere back when I was in seminary, a guy brought some mustard seeds. And it was a yellow mustard seed. I mean, it was, it was so tiny that, oh, Jane, you've got a mustard seed, don't you? You have one right there. That's hard to see. Can any of you see that? No. <laughs> and, uh, just a few of you because you're sitting up front here. See how small that is? See how tiny that is? I mean, you can barely hold that between your fingers. And in fact, it's so light, it's so feather light. That there's an old phrase, that, I mean, it feels like nothing. Right? It feels like nothing. Jane, that's awesome. Way to go. I didn't realize you were going to be part of my sermon today. Thank you. Thank you. That's what a mustard seed looks like. And he says, the kingdom of God is like, or the kingdom of heaven is like, is like a mustard seed. And Jesus says that um, it is uh, perhaps, um, he says, uh, it's, it, it's a man who sowed it in the field and it's smaller than all other seeds. And let me just, let me give you an aside for a moment, okay? Because we know that there's a seed that's smaller than the mustard seed. There's an orchid seed. But I want you to know some Jesus didn't make a mistake here. By the way, if you look at the internet, you can see all kinds of articles going back and forth on this whole thing. But I want to tell you something. Jesus is not addressing the, the uh, school of botany here. Okay? Jesus doesn't, that's not worried about that. He's speaking proverbially. And I want you to know that at least to farmers in that day, this certainly would have been one of the, probably the smallest seed that's there. So you can't build any case by saying, well, Jesus was wrong because he didn't talk about the small It is, but it was the smallest seed that they knew. And he spoke proverbially at the time, but that's not the point. The point is this. Jesus compares the kingdom of God. And he says that the kingdom of God is so tiny, it's hardly anything. But then it becomes immense. Because did you know that a mustard seed, from one mustard seed, a tree could grow anywhere from 10 to 12, 13, 15 feet tall? Where the birds of the air can nest in its branches? 
The comparison is so absurd that it's so minute and so tiny, and it becomes this huge tree. I'm going to apply this in a moment, but let me go to the second parable, Matthew 13, 33. He spoke another parable in the kingdom of heaven is like leaven. Don't you love Jesus? Guys, the kingdom of heaven is like a woman who makes bread. I mean, man, I would, I would, have, I would have said the kingdom of heaven was like, uh, you know, Michael Jordan. You know, I mean, somebody great. But and that's not, I'm not trying to say anything about women, but I mean, just women making bread. Okay? What's leaven? You know what leaven is? Leaven is, like, we refer to it normally as yeast. And yeast is, is a substance that causes an expansion or a rising of dough or bread. Okay? In, in the Bible, by the way, leaven is most often has a negative connotation to it. It's, it's referred to as evil, especially when um, uh, they fled from Egypt uh, in, in, in the book of Exodus and they had to leave. They were to purge all of the leaven out of the home and so forth. So it's thought of as evil. But here Jesus uses leaven as something positive, as something that works silently, secretly, but it's very effective in altering and transforming the dough. Becky and I were talking about this the other day. And I want you to know that when Becky makes rolls, she takes a little over two teaspoons of yeast and eleven six cups of flour, and with that combination, the end product is between two and three dozen delicious rolls, just from a little bit of yeast. Man, I'm getting hungry just talking about it. You know? But, but, but something so small helps produce a great crop of rolls that I love to eat and Thanksgiving's coming, praise God, you know? I mean, man, you know? So the point that Jesus is making, again, is that the mustard seed is so tiny that something very big grows of it. The leaven is so minute, and yet it affects, its effects are so great. And Jesus said the kingdom of God starts small, and it grows big, and what does that mean for you and me? What does that mean for you and for me? That was a nice Bible story and so forth, but we've got to take this and we've got to ask ourselves, what does it mean for you and me? Five areas. First of all, it refers to Jesus. This is Jesus' life. He started off his life on earth, small, humble, simple ways. He grew up in a small town. His mother was a teenager who was a virgin. She gave birth to him. Jesus was a country boy. And yet now he's worshipped by more than a few billion people today. He's worshipped by more than a few billion today as Lord and God and Savior. That's how Christianity started. You remember the book of Acts? The book of Acts says that there are 120 in the upper room. You start with 120 in the upper room, and now you've got a couple billion today. That's how the kingdom of God works, right? Small to big. Let me give you the second thing. It also refers to our spiritual life. This is how spiritual life works. You repent of your sin. You believe in Jesus Christ. You understand the gospel. You understand that you and I are sinners. Hopeless without God. But in spite of that sin, Jesus came with grace. And he said, I love you and I'm coming for you. And I died for you. I paid the price for you. I was crushed for your iniquities. And we understand that it is by grace that we're saved through faith. And when we're saved that we're justified by Him. We're declared righteous. We're not made righteous. We're declared righteous in Him. We're made like Him. We understand that. And by grace we're saved through faith. And then we become a part of His family. We become a part of His kingdom. And when that happens, I start a new life with Him. The Holy Spirit starts to work in my life. I understand that. I begin the spiritual life. I begin the Christian life. And I start to grow. And there are some of you here who started your Christian life a year ago, maybe even shorter than that. Some of you started a long time ago. But it's amazing when you think about it. I've been a Christian now since 1972. That's a long time. When I think back to where I was as a 15-year-old teenager with hair that was down to my shoulders. And, and peace, man, you know? And I was wearing tie-dye shirts and tie-dye jeans, and, and I had these platform shoes, you know? Man. 
There are days when I'd love to go back to that. No, no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. But think about where you started and to where you're at now. It starts small. It gets big, right? That's the way the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God works. Third, it refers to the local church. Tim was reflecting on this. Ten years ago, things were pretty small around here. Now, I'm not saying they're huge either. No. But when you think back as to where this was at 10, 11 years ago to where it is now, right? It starts small. And it gets bigger. And that's the way it is oftentimes with local churches. That's the way the kingdom of God starts to work. Fourth, it refers to ministry. One of the things that I had talked about with our deacons, and our deacons are known as our church health team. One of the things I've talked about with, with uh, uh, Dr. Dr. Blackburn is about starting, starting more small groups here at the church. And we're looking for people to start small, maybe in a home, maybe in a condominium, maybe in an apartment building, people who belong to the king, people who love the kingdom, and we want to see it become a tree. We want to see if the lump of dough can become some beautiful homemade bread. And so, we're praying about this. We have some small groups already. We have Sunday school classes. We have ladies' Bible studies. We have our prayer group that meets on Wednesday evening. We have ministry teams. But one of the, one of the desires we have is for, for people to be a part of small groups. Because the kingdom works starting small, and it grows. And it gets bigger. And the last thing is that it refers to the church worldwide. One of my favorite books is uh, Tim Keller's book called The Reason for God. And I want to read something to you that he writes. It's about the third or fourth or fifth page. It's read to, fairly new at the beginning of the book. He says, I want you to listen to what he says. He says, there was a widespread belief in the late 19th and early 20th century that religion would weaken and die out as the human race became more technologically advanced. This view saw religion as playing a role in evolution. We once needed religion to help us cope with a frightening, incomprehensible world, but as we become more scientifically sophisticated and more able to understand and control our environment, our need for religion would diminish, it was thought. But this is not happening. And this quote-unquote secularization thesis is now largely discredited. In fact, virtually all major religions are growing in number of adherents. Christianity's growth, especially in the developing world, has been explosive. Korea has gone from 1% to 40% Christian in 100 years. And experts believe that the same thing is going to happen in China. In fact, I was listening to Tim Keller on a YouTube video called Google, or Authors at Google, he was speaking to atheists at the Mountain View, uh, uh, California headquarters of Google. And he said that today there are more Christians in China than there are in the United States. Isn't that amazing? We thought about China as this lost world, as this destitute world, this communist world. There are more Christians in China than there are here in the United States. And he says, in most cases, the Christianity that is growing is not the more secularized, belief-thin versions predicted by sociologists. Rather, it is a robust, supernaturalist kind of faith with belief in miracles, scriptural authority, and personal conversion. <coughs> Amen? Amen? I mean, I hope that encourages you. I hope that encourages you because... We often have a tendency to oh, things are dying, things are bad, things are... No. It started small, and now it's huge. It's immense. That's how the kingdom works. It starts small.
small, but it becomes big, and that's the reason he tells us these two parables. Now, there's a third thing I need to tell you from all of this, and that is this. There's prophecy fulfilled in Jesus. And I, I find this interesting. After he tells these two parables, in verse 34 and 35, it says, All these things Jesus spoke to the crowds in parables, and he did not speak to them without a parable. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophets. You see that? This was to fulfill prophecy. I will obey my mouth in par I will, excuse me, I'll open my mouth in parables. I will utter things hidden since the foundation of the world. I just want you to notice here that Matthew tells us that Jesus is the fulfillment of prophecy. It was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. And now notice the words, I'll open my mouth. That's from Psalm 78, verse 2. And Psalm 78, verse 2 says, I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old. Now, why is that important? What is the big deal about mentioning that here? Well, the fact of the matter is, if you go back to Psalm 78, there was a fellow by the name of Asaph. And he was giving instructions as the people assembled to worship God. And Asaph is going to give them a history lesson. He's going to give them a history lesson, and then he's going to ask them to pass along what they learned to the next generation. The reason Matthew quotes Psalm 78, because he wants to press on the point that Jesus is the Messiah, looked for the prophets of old, and he's now in his day fulfilling that prophecy. And there are five ways Jesus fulfills that prophecy. I read Psalm 78. It's a long psalm. I'm not going to read it all to you, but I want you to see how it's fulfilled. First of all, Jesus is our teacher and our guide. Now notice, in Psalm 78, verse 2, it does say that I'll open my mouth in a parable. In other words, Asaph is teaching in a parabolic form when he gives us Psalm 78. Well, the, the, the fulfillment is Jesus is now teaching in parables, and the application is that Jesus is a teacher, and he must be our teacher. He must be our teacher. He is the authority for our life. He is, his book, the Bible, is the only authority of faith and practice. We must present Jesus as found in Scripture so that people may be saved through him. So he fulfills it first of all as our teacher and our guide. Secondly, Jesus manifests God's power and love. You'll notice I have the verses up there. I can't read all of those verses to you. But there in that psalm, uh, the Asaph recounts God's power and God's loving kindness to Israel throughout its, all, all of its generation. And the fulfillment is that Jesus does so even more because Jesus is the greatest manifestation of God's power. Jesus is the greatest manifestation of God's love. And no one has God more clearly displayed in His love and His power and His grace and His wonders. And that means we must acknowledge His deity as our greatest manifestation of God's power and God's love. He is the Messiah and He loves God, and, and He is God's love clearly seen for you and for me. There's a third thing, and that is Jesus rejected. In other words, when you read that psalm, you're going to find that not only is, is God this great king and this great power, but He was often rejected. He was often rejected by His own people. And the fulfillment, of course, is Jesus is also often rejected today by Jews, by Gentiles, by point is, we must acknowledge him as the one promised for all of us, Jew and Gentile. There is no other name given among heaven by which men and women may be saved. He must be acknowledged as the one promised for all, as the only way and truth in life. Fourth, Jesus is our shepherd. At the end of that psalm, there's a sort of this triumphant note where David is set over Israel as, as the shepherd of the people. The fulfillment, of course, is Jesus is our good shepherd. John 10, uh, 11 and verse 14, that he is our good shepherd, and that speaks of him being a guide, a teacher, a trusted shepherd in life. And the last thing is this, is that Jesus' kingdom work is immense, but it's still unfulfilled. The psalm seems to indicate that prophecy has been fulfilled in God. As it continues on, it's now fulfilled when Jesus came this first time. But Jesus, and that kingdom is still not fulfilled. Which means that he's still telling you and I, 
to go and make disciples of all the nations. Jesus is still telling you and I to be his mouthpieces so that we can bring Jesus into our relationships. My prayer is this. We don't put our lives on autopilot. We don't coast. But we're longing to bring Christ into relationships. We're longing for God and His Word. We're longing for the milk of His Word. We're longing to be like Him. So that what was small becomes big. Big in the sense of eternal uh, kingdom and impact. Where His, as Tim says to all His priorities and His character becomes our priorities, our character, so that others can have Jesus as their priority and their character in life as well. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the opportunity to look at these two parables again. Simple parables, Lord, big truth. Thank you, God, for your word today. Thank you for Jesus who fulfills that prophecy. And thank you, God, that we as your people have been given a charge and given a commission to bring Christ to our neighbors, our friends, our loved ones, and to do it in kind, compassionate ways, but bold ways, Father, so that um, they too may know the joy of being one of your, of one of your fathers. And so thank you, Lord, for being so good to us. We thank you, Lord, and we rejoice today that you are king. I pray in Jesus' name.